Hello Ethical Hackers, welcome back to this new video in which we're going to see how to brute force parameters and headers and cookies using param minor burp extension. This is a free extension which you can download and use on burp community edition as well. A lot of time developers purposely or mistakenly leave special parameters, headers or cookie names, thinking that they are the only ones who know them. They base their logic upon it. For example, you can have a parameter administrator. This is a predictable parameter name, but think about this use case. Just bear with me. A developer just validates if a user is a, an admin or not based on a get parameter named admin. So if you just brute force with this extension using admin equals true, for example, you land on an administrator page. Of course, this is just too good to be true, but you can find plenty of vulnerabilities based on those wrong assumptions that developers make. Let's just go ahead and install it as usual. And nothing happens, no new tab is there. And that's normal because um, you can access the features of parameter miner from the other tools such as proxy, um, repeater, etc. So here, for example, if we are targeting the post API complaints endpoint, we've seen that in previous video when we talked about software vulnerability scanner. So let's say we want to brute force this. Uh, bear in mind that this is the live Heroku app which is deployed by the maintainer of Juice Shop app. So it's not a good idea to just go ahead and brute force it. But I'm just going to show you how it works and, and then we can test it on a live website that we own. Usually it goes this way. You just right click and here you can see a whole new set of options that you get from the con contextual menu. You can guess get parameters. You can guess cookies, headers, JSON parameters, and you have other options here. So if you choose guess get parameters, for example, you get access to this intimidating panel, which allows you to configure some options. For example, you have the thread pool size. This is just how fast you want your tests to go. You can choose a custom word list path. Let's say, for example, you have constructed a word list for this particular target, so you can point it here and then you just hit OK. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to use a local instance of WebGoat, which I'm running using the OWASP Top 10 Lab that I provide as part of the OWASP Top 10 playlist, which you can find on the Hackerish YouTube channel. Just you scroll down and you can find it in the description box here and you can just go ahead and download it. So I have my instance running of WebGoat and let's take a random request. First of all, I'm just going to use my burp instance to proxy the requests and maybe just go to challenge two on the authentication bypass challenge. It's just a random challenge. So I'm going to enter a random answer for those questions and then submit. The idea here is not to solve that challenge per se, but to see how parameter miner works. So we captured our post request, which as you can see points to the auth bypass verify account. We have post parameters, we have cookies, and we have some HTTP headers. Let's say that we want to brute force parts of this request. Well, let's right click and let's just say for the sake of this example, we want to guess cookie parameters. I'm going to leave these as default and then hit OK. You can see that nothing happens, but if you go to extender extensions and then parameter miner, you can see that we have an output here. We have loaded parameter miner and we are initiating a cookie brute force on this target. And it says that it's completed. 
we have no errors, which means that everything went well, but we don't find anything. Let's see how this extension works behind the scenes. If you recall from our previous video I've made, we've installed Logger++, which allows you to capture not only the requests through the proxy, but every request that's ever made using Burp Suit, including other extensions. And now let's just rerun our previous request. This time we might target the headers instead. And let's hit OK. Right away you can see we have a bunch of requests that are being issued. And if you click on one of them, you can see that indeed the request has changed the post to a get method as part of the testing that it does. It tries to inject those two headers and then something in the get parameter, although we instructed it to brute force only headers. In this case, you can see that we have the origin header, which is set to an arbitrary domain names. This is useful to test for cross origin resource sharing misconfigurations, for example. So it's trying different well known HTTP headers and trying to figure out if there are any HTTP responses which might hint that this header is actually being evaluated in the backend or the proxy somewhere along the way. I can spot the X forwarded for IP, which is used for web proxies. So let's now cheat a little bit and use a request which has a parameter remove it and then try to find it using parameter miner. If we take the same one, if we send it to the repeater and send the request, we have this response. So let's say that we remove the user ID and resend it. Right away, we see that we have a different response. So let's see if we can use other values here. I'm just going to input a random one and hit send. We have a response which might be detected by parameter miner. Let's just give it a try. Let's remove this parameter and then try to brute force post requests. Right click and let's guess body parameter. Let's use the predefined word list that comes with prime miner and hit OK. Now, if we go to extensions, it says here that we are initiating a body brute force on our target in logger plus plus. We should see some requests with random parameter names. So for example, we have user ID blah, blah equals. So here, for example, you can see that it tried the parameter name zoom. Another one here called trigger, another setting. The scan has finished. And as a result, we have identified parameter user ID. Parameter miner has detected that there is a parameter in the post body called user ID. Likewise, if you go to the target sitemap tabs and choose your target, you can see that we have a new entry called secret input. It says here that an unlinked input was identified. In the first request, we had user ID with a random value and we got this response. When we sent the second parameter, the second request, which didn't contain the user ID, the response was different. So this clearly means for parameter miner that the parameter user ID is somewhat evaluated by the backend. So this is generally how it works, but let's go even deeper. It's always a good idea to read what the extension is offering and also to read about the documentation if there's any. And I want to draw your attention to this phrase here. It's particularly useful for finding web cache poisoning vulnerabilities. So you might be wondering what is web cache poisoning vulnerabilities? If you remember, we barely touched upon it when we talked about parameter mining, injecting random parameter names in the URL part? Well, let's give it a try and see if we can learn something new. This is a blog post by James Kettle, a security researcher known for some novel vulnerabilities such as HTTP request smuggling, 
and he also works for the team behind Burp Suit. He is also known for, for web cache poisoning. You can read about it in a great detail in the white paper, and you can also watch his awesome talk. So I encourage you to go through this blog post and learn about how caching works. I'm not going to go through all the blog posts, but in the basic poisoning section, the author stated that Parameter Miner immediately spotted an unkeyed input. In this case, it was the X-forwarded host. It was basically used by the application to generate a URL inside a meta tag. So in the response, you can see that we have the value of the X-forwarded host header being injected into the meta tag. So what he did was just inject a cross-site scripting payload and it automatically got injected in the meta tag as well. The problem though is that you need to be the victim. You need to send this from your own browser so you would exploit just yourself. But thanks to cache poisoning, you can poison the cache with this response and then someone else would fetch this endpoint and if he does, then he will get that response because the cache just takes this part as a key to determine if the version that should be served to the user is the one stored in the cache. Notice that it's using a somewhat unique or random get parameter and that's to avoid poisoning other users. So whenever you're trying to poke for cache poisoning vulnerabilities, bear in mind that you should use random parameter names which are not likely to be used by the public so that you avoid exploiting them. And that's why we have these kind of parameters here to make sure that even though we poison the cache, it doesn't affect legitimate users. If you found this content helpful, make sure to like, comment and subscribe to this channel so that you get updates whenever I publish a new video on ethical hacking and bug bounty hunting. If you're new to hacking and want to learn the basics, check out the free OWASP Top 10 Theory and Hands-on training on thehackerish.com and apply your knowledge on the lab which supports it. If you enjoy learning with videos, I invite you to watch the OWASP Top 10 YouTube playlist. However, I encourage you to first try to solve the lab exercises so that you don't spoil them. Don't forget that there are supporting blog posts for most of the videos you watch on this YouTube channel. I also encourage you to subscribe to the Friday newsletter on thehackerish.com to gain some new hacking knowledge at the end of the week. If you enjoy listening while doing other things at the same time, check out the Hack for Fun and Profit podcast, link in the description box. Until next time, stay curious, keep learning, and go find some bugs.